Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Koinonia Hour. Again, I have Howard Elseth back. And just before Howard says a word, um, Howard has agreed to come back once a week as he's able. Because, you know, sometimes life isn't perfect and sometimes things have to be done. <laughs> but just to let you guys know, officially, he'll be coming back um, every week unless there's another issue. But praise the Lord, uh, we have him here today. So I want to welcome you back, Howard. Thank you. Thank you again for this privilege. Today, I want to talk about the holy masculine. Now, think about this. Genesis 1.27 says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. If you look at this verse carefully, you'll find the male concept. Man, his, he, male, he, him. Five times he mentions the masculine, one time the feminine. He's setting a pattern right up front here in Genesis 1.1. So we look at this, we go to Isaiah 60, or excuse me, 6.1. And he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up. The focus is on the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, which had six wings, with twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. Five times mentions the masculinity, again, number five times, Genesis 127, now Isaiah 6, 3. And one cried to another and said, holy, holy is the Lord, or holy, holy is the masculine, if you want, because the Lord is masculine. The Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Now we go over to Revelation chapter 4, verse, verse 8. And it says, The four beasts, each of them six wings about him. So these beasts, the seraphims, are male. You have four plus he, that's five times the masculine is mentioned here. And they were full of eyes. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat upon the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Can you imagine? Well, we're sitting here on this little broadcast, these seraphims are saying, holy, holy, holy. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, holy, holy, holy. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. So this is the main overarching theme of the whole Bible. When you take the little word holy and translate it into a number, it comes out to 1611. So in a sense, these angels are saying day and night, holy, holy, holy. They're saying 1611, 1611, 1611. Isn't that powerful what God is doing? And, and we kind of overlook these words. We, we, we just take them for granted. But if you study out uh, and see 
the masculinity. Now, this is Christianity. It's flanked by holy, holy, holy. 1611, 1611. God's name in numbers, I am that I am, comes out exactly to 1611. So you see this. I found this in the scriptures. I'm sure it's 100,000 times or more, but I've found it 40,000 times, the number 1611. Now, you contrast Christianity, which is a masculine religion. The temple was masculine. The uh, tabernacle was known as a he. The church, the head of the church is Christ, which is male. We often look at it. It has female in it, obviously. That's the component, but the head is masculine. Now, the common denominator of all pagan religions is the sacred feminine. Now, this is a word, sacred. I don't believe you're going to find it in the Old Covenant or in the New Covenant. God uses the word holy. The world uses the term sacred, the sacred feminine. I'll show you an example of the sacred feminine. I don't know if you can see this. This is, oops, I got it upside down. There you go. This is a New Testament, Reims New Testament, 1633. Now, the Catholic, this is a Catholic Bible. They're getting mighty bold in their position. If you can see this here, this is the goddess Diana with her multitude of breasts showing they're worshiping the holy feminine. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you'll see all these little yellow pages. Everyone we turn to, there she is again. She is in here. There she is again. They put her in here 18 times. Wow. They're stressing the Holy Feminine. It got too obvious what they were doing, got too much reaction. So in subsequent Bibles, they pull that. But they're showing their true colors here. So you're either walking with Baal which means to be married, and you're in the holy feminine, and you're pushing feminism, or you're pushing masculinity. Noah Webster came along and didn't like this concept and changed Holy Ghost, the masculinity, to Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit is called a he, but, but she play, he plays the role of the feminine in the scripture just like Jesus came to play the role of the perfect female. Most people don't see him as that role, but everything he did was in submission and subjection to the masculine father in heaven. And that's the role of marriage. This whole Bible is about a mar marriage concept. So we, we, we've got to uh, keep an eye on this. And one of the things that we can see this picture also is in the fig tree. Now remember in Matthew 21, 19, Jesus cursed the fig tree. Now why would he curse a tree that's full of leaves? Well, if you understand a fig tree, fig tree usually brings the fruit first and then the leaves after. So if a, you see a fig tree full of leaves, it's gonna be plump full of fruit. But because there was no fruit, Jesus cursed it. And he said, forever, you are going to be cursed. So uh, what that fig tree kind of represents is if you have an outward show of righteousness, but have no inward fruit, the Bible is calling you a hypocrite and you're of no value to the kingdom of God. It's a warning how to put fear in us. If you're walking around trying to impress people, a big show 
of your efforts and you don't have fruit in your life. Jesus said you'll know them by their fruits. So now we got to take a quick look at the fig tree. We go over to Matthew chapter 24. 32. Now listen to these words carefully. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. The first thing we notice here is the spelling of fig tree. It's fig with a hyphen in there. And so when you translate it into a number, it comes out to 13, which is the word. This book, this Bible, this is the fig tree. But we go to the next uh, verse there. So likewise, when you see all these things, that it is near at the door. Oops. Okay. So likewise, ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall pass until all these be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, W-O-R-D-E-S, shall not pass away. So he's telling you here words that this fig tree represents the He Bible. Notice what it says. Now learn the parable of the fig tree when his branch, this is male. He always starts out with the male to the female. Notice the pattern that God sets here. When his branch is yet tender and bringeth forth leaves. So we have the fig tree, which represents the words that is corresponded with the spelling of the words heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, W-O-R-D-E-S, shall not pass away. Now we go over to Mark, and we see the companion gospel here, and now we can see why Matthew comes before Mark. A lot of scholars try to tell us Mark was the first written, and even maybe suggest that it should come forth, uh, it should be actually presented before Matthew. But you see this order here. We have the male. Now we see the female coming about. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is tender. You ever seen that before? You got the he, got the she. Now we, we see a different spelling of fig. Fig is now spelled F-I-G. It's that way in, Ma in Matthew, but it's separated from the tree because three or, or fig with three letters coming out to three means light, life, wisdom, and knowledge because it's the woman or the she that's always identified with the teaching of wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Remember in Proverbs, wisdom has hewed her seven pillars. It's always with the female. So it's very important to see these patterns. So we go on here. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye, in like manner, when ye shall see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Wow, I was going to talk about doors a while with the double O. The good shepherd, I am the door. This is all talking about the return of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Verily I say to you that this generation shall not pass 
till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall not pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now he spells words differently. That's the, one of the beauties of the 1611 Bible is you can learn so much because everything is in the spellings. You take the word dear, we've talked about this before, D-E-A-R, that can be your wife, can be your child, can be a friend, a good friend. Just change one letter, change D-E-A-R to D-E-E-R. Now it's a four-legged creature that you can hunt and eat. You just change one letter. It changes the whole dynamics of, of those two beings. One can be your wife, one is a four-legged creature obviously different that one letter changes so much so here we see the same thing words w-o-r-d-e-s talking about the book and 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 the written word the thumb now we're going to urim w-o-r-d-s just a simple s and, and we see here that it's tied to knowledge, to wisdom, to understanding, to light, and to life. All in that simple little changing of the word fig and the word word by just changing one letter in that word. So this becomes exciting. Now let's go to the church. Did you see what it said? Now learn. God is instructing you and I to learn, to learn something, what he's trying to teach us. Now he takes us to the third area. Instead of a he and a her, now he's going to change to they and them because he's dealing now with the body, with the church. So we go here in uh, Luke chapter 21, starting with, 29, and he spake to them a parable. <clears throat> Excuse me. Behold the fig tree. Now you see what he did here. He spelled fig F I G G E instead of just F I G. Now we got a double G there. We've got a spiritual concept happening here. What is he doing? He's taking us way back to Genesis 3, 7. Remember Adam and Eve sowed fig leaves. This fig comes out to 10 instead of 3. Okay, this is representing the church. Listen to what he said here. And he spake to them a parable. Behold, the fig tree and all the trees. You see that? We are represented as trees. He's talking about all nations, all people, all tribes of Israel, the, the church. He's talking about everybody in this parable. See, he, he was showing the beginning there. Now learn about the fig tree and him. Then it goes to her. Now it's going to, and he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye, double E, so we're dealing with the spiritual, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, using the W-O-R-D-S. So watch these patterns as they begin to develop. Notice the masculinity here and the role, and then we go to the female, and then he puts it them, 
because in heaven there's neither male nor female. We're all one. It becomes a them or a they. Now, uh, I don't know if this is a good thing to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. Is I'm going to give everybody here that's listening a little quiz. And I'm almost certain you're going to all get the first question right. But when we get to the second and third questions, I think you're going to uh, feel some maybe some growing pains here. Okay. We look at Genesis 1 1, and the Bible talks about we give things line upon line. And if, if you have a 1611 Bible, uh, I, I want you to, well, I don't want you to look right now, but I'm going to ask you this question What's the first line in a 1611 Bible? In other words, how does what are the first three words of, and, the, and there's three words in each of these lines, what are the first three words in the Old Testament? Do you know, Joni? I bet you do. In the beginning. You got it. Huh? You're, you got an A on that first quiz. Okay, in the beginning. Now, if I were to ask you, what does in the beginning translate into as far as numbers? You might not know, so I'm going to help you out. In is eight. The comes out to three. And beginning comes out to 16. Well, I'm sure everybody can add eight and three is 11. And so what you have there is 1611. The Bible begins because it's called a 1611 he Bible. It's the masculine Bible. It begins 1611. Now, every Christian I know, I've never had anybody miss that one. I think it's amazing. So then I take them to question number two. I'm going to skip over the Apocrypha for a minute here. What are the first three words of the new covenant. And, you know, I've never had a preacher get this right. First three words of the New Testament. I've never heard a single Christian get this right, unless I've taught them this. And everybody should know that. If we're so big on the old covenant and really big on the New Testament, because this is where Jesus comes into the picture. This is where the crucifixion comes into the picture. Of course, Jesus was in the Old Testament before that, before Abraham I was, but where we start understanding that and, and a deeper role of the church. Why is it that nobody knows what the first three words of the New Testament are? Okay, we, we take a look at this. The first line says this, the book of. And then it goes on, the generation of Jesus Christ. It's the book. You see what the whole New Testament, the focus is on the book. If you look in the last chapter of Revelation, it talks about the book, the book of, the book over and over again, maybe eight, ten times in there. So learning about the book. Now we go, uh, and if you study and know numbers, it's introducing you, not only does it talk about the 1611 in numbers in that first scripture, it talks about the 1833, because these are the bookends. They're like the borders of a country, of God's spiritual country. The border is 1611. He and the image of the 1611. He, remember, the image of God made man, male and female, made he them. But he used that word image twice and capitalizes the word image. Very important. See, all idols are images, but they can't speak. They can't talk. They're not alive. The difference between this book, it's alive. It is very much alive. Mm -hmm. 
I remember I was kind of, uh, I was one of three or four pastors in this church in Texas. And the leader of the church, a wonderful man named Ernest. And uh, we had, a, a, I should say, it was basically he founded the church. And he, he founded it with an open pulpit, which meant that any one of us four preachers, and actually anybody else in the church, if they had a message from God, were welcome to come up to the pulpit and preach. And I remember this one Sunday, it seemed like something big was going to happen this Sunday. And I had my message prepared. And I'm sitting there in the seat. And I started to get up to go to the pulpit to preach. God said, sit down. So I'm sitting down and there's kind of a silence and nobody moved. And I thought, why are we waiting? It seemed like a minute I'm sitting there. So I, I get ready. I get up and I'm getting ready to go to the pulpit. God says, sit down. So I go sit down again. A third time, I feel like little Samuel, you know, I don't know how many times I've got to do this. So I, 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 I just start to get up again. And the third time, God says, sit down, just wait. So I sit down and wait. And I don't know if the other three preachers were doing the same thing. But all of a sudden, Ernest gets up, walks to the pulpit, and starts preaching. Very powerful message. He gets about 10 minutes into the message, and he drops dead right in the pulpit. Whoa. Of course, we tried to revive them. We couldn't revive them. Call the EMTs. They came. They couldn't revive them. And, and uh, it was just a powerful event. And then I found myself Monday morning, the next morning, preaching at his funeral. Well, about... Two weeks later, we kept meeting in the church, and our leader has passed away, so they're kind of shifting gears, who's going to lead, and so forth. And uh, his widow decided she was going to kind of run the church. Wasn't her position. There were three pastors there, anyone capable of pastoring. But she took on the role of a pastor, which the Bible says a woman is not supposed to do. About two weeks into her leadership, she took, she had a King James Bible. She took the King James Bible, held it in her hands. She said, this is nothing but ink and paper. And she threw it on the floor. I could feel the Holy Ghost just leaving the church. He said, I'm done. This church is done. Within, I think it was no more than three weeks of meeting after that event. The doors were closed. Nobody came anymore. Eventually, I believe the building got sold. Somebody turned it into a house. It was over. You see, this book is not ink and paper. Yes, there's ink there, there's paper, but it's the presence of God. The book is alive. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. Okay, hold on one sec. We were disconnected for about uh, 15 seconds. Can you go back maybe just a little bit when you said, and the doors were closed and you felt the Holy Spirit leave. So can you go back? The Holy Ghost leave, yeah. Yeah, I I felt when she after she threw that book on the floor, it just changed the whole dynamics of the church. It's like she spit on God's face. I I, I don't think she meant that uh, in her heart, but she had misunderstood that 
she looked at the Bible separate from, from God's presence, from Jesus' presence. You see, and that closed the doors of that church. You see, earlier we found in Joshua 3.13, let me read that, Joshua 3.13, And I, I might have brought this up before, but it, it doesn't hurt to go over things again and again to see this when some of this is new to you. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. That's a very important scripture. Now, here the children of Israel are crossing the Jordan, and uh, the ark w was a box. See, when Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments, and later when he saw they had built a golden calf and were starting to follow Baal, he got so angry he threw the Ten Commandments that God had written with his finger on the ground or on the stones and smashed them. God said, wait a minute. Let's do this all over again. You hew out some stones and you bring them up to me and I'll write them with my finger. Finger of God, by the way, comes out to 1611 also. So he says, I'll write them. The 1611 is going to write them. And, but this time, I want you to build a box or an ark. Now, most of us think when we say, what was in the ark? Well, it was Aaron's rod that budded, pot of manna, and the Ten Commandments, which is all true. That's, the box was there to protect the Word of God. But in the side of the box, we see over in Deuteronomy uh, 30, 31, he said, take the book of the law and keep that in your mind, book of the law. It's a very important because you're going to see a seismic shift after a bit here. Take this book of the law and put it in the side of the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against thee. This is a legal document, and a witness is someone who tells the story in a courtroom. This is a witness against each of us who will be tried someday and is appointed on the man, wants to die after that, the judgment. This book is going to judge us. So the ark was a box to protect the manna, to protect Aaron's rod, to protect the Ten Commandments, and to protect the book of the law. But the problem is, is Israel, and like that movie that came out, Raiders of the Lost Ark, everybody got fascinated with the box and overlooked the book. That's exactly the same thing. What is a church? A church is nothing but a big box that holds people. And most people are enamored with the box more than they are with the book. Amen. The book is the key to everything. And he said, the ark is the Lord of the whole earth. Remember when the tree of life, the physical tree of life was the Lord of all the earth, the whole earth. But then Adam and Eve went to the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And they got hooked up with Baal. And God said, you can't, I can't have that in my kingdom. You're out of here. So he throws them out of the garden of Eden. So that tree no longer was in their presence, and they could no longer eat of it. So this is why God starts us back at, at Mount Sinai and, and gives us the Ten Commandments. 
So, so powerful, he gives us these Ten Commandments and then he puts them in the box and the box becomes the representative of the Lord of the whole earth. We got to fo follow this. The, the, uh, it talks about the angel of God led them through the wilderness and through the Red Sea. Just do the math on angel of God. Once you start doing this math, it's so much fun because angel of God comes out to 1611. And so our 1611 Bible is our present angel of God on this earth today. Now, it was not just the angel of God that led them because it tells us also that the Lord led them. The Lord and the 1611. Because you got to remember Urm and Thummim. Urm is the spirit and life. Thummim is the tome or the book or the physical. He always has the physical and the spiritual working in harmony. So the angel of God here would be on the earth here. And then you have the spiritual Lord, the Urm and the Thummim led them through the wilderness. Do you see that picture? You got to catch that picture. It's so, so mighty important. So we have this quiz going here. We have in Genesis, in the beginning, we have in the New Testament, the book of. Okay, now, does anybody know the first three words of the Apocrypha? Here it is. And Josiah held. Now, he, what he's going to hold there is the greatest Passover that's ever been held. But the first three words, if you take the line off there, is, and Josiah held. Now, I don't know if you know about crossover reading. I'll give you an example of it. In Revelation chapter 22, if you notice, the King James Bible, 1830, is set up with two columns. Okay, and in between the two columns, we call it the river of life. That river flows down the middle. It's always clear. It's never cluttered. It's a pure river of life. And it says on either side of the river was the tree of life. So this is the wholesome words, the tree of life on each side of the river. So you're, you're overeating the fruit on this one side here. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Well, the throne be up on the top here, and the river flows out of there. And it says, in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, there was a tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. Notice that revelation, the fruit of the tree of life is female. So then we know there's got to be a talking of the tree of life before that, Psalms 1, 1, 1, or Psalms 1, 1. The tree of life there is masculine. Always that pattern, always that order. So we look here in this scripture here, we take this phrase, he says, line upon line, precept upon precept, he's going to teach us. So we take this line out of the throne of God and we take the curtain down because the curtain, the veil has been torn or we cross the river just like crossing the Jordan and look what it says. Out of the throne of God, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you. You see how beautifully, have you ever read scripture that way where you cross over from one bank of the river to the other, 
and and you get a, a harmonious and and they're just lined up perfectly here. So I just thought I'd throw that in here. So now we're going to do that with books. Let's take these words. In the beginning, Josiah held the book. Now, who was the preacher or who was the king that found the book of the law? under his administration. Well, let's go to Second Chronicles chapter 34. And Josiah was eight years old when he became king. That's an interesting age because eight means a new beginning. And indeed it was. And he did that was right in the sight of the Lord. And he walked in the ways of David, his father. And he declined neither to the right hand nor to the, to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, now he's 16 years old, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David, his father. And in the 12th year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high place. Now, 20 years old, after four years of seeking, he begins to purge from the high places and the groves and the carved images and the molten image. And they break down the altar of Balaam. See, he had to get Baal out of the way because Israel had gotten married to Baal. They now had to get a divorce because he wants to bring Israel back to God. They break down the altars of Balaam in his presence and the images that were high above them. He cut down the groves and the carved images and the molten images. He break in pieces, made dust of them and strewed them upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. Wow. He burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars. He cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. A big mess of cleansing. That's what we need in America today. It's a big mess of cleansing. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon and after Naphtali and with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images into powder, he cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel. He returned to Jerusalem. Remember how John and little children keep yourself from idols. Idols is our most biggest problem in America today. We're full of idolatry. The world is full of idolatry. Remember, an idol can't speak, it can't talk, can't think, it can't do anything. It doesn't have life. That's what, and God is jealous that we would worship an idol instead of worshiping him, our creator. Now, in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he said, Shaphan, the son of Aziel and Manasseh, and the governor of the city, and Oha, the son of Ohaz, some of these names I have a hard time pronouncing, the recorder to repair the house of the Lord his God. 18 year. Now he's 26 years old. We're watching him progressively getting older. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites had kept, had kept the doors, had gathered the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim and all the remnant of Israel and all Judah and Benjamin and the return to Jerusalem. And they put it in the hand of the workmen that had oversight 
of the house of the Lord, and they gave it to the workmen that wrought in the house of the Lord to repair and mend the house. He's 26 years old. They're repairing the house. Even the artificers, the builders gave it, they it to buy hewn stone and timber for couplings and to floor the houses which the kings of Judah had destroyed. Can you imagine the kings of Judah destroying God's house? And the men did work faithfully, and the overseers of them were uh, Isa, Obadiah, the Levites of the sons of Mariah and Shechariah and Mishalem, and the sons of the Kohath, Kohathites, they set forward, and the other of the Levites, all that could skill of instruments of music. So they had people playing music and they're rebuilding the house. And there were over the bearers of burdens and overseers of all that wrought the work in any manner of service and of the Levites, there were the scribes, the officers, and the porters. And when they brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, he'd be the high priest, found a book of the law. Josiah is known as the king who under his reign, they had lost the book. Can you imagine the most important thing on this earth, the book of the law? They found it. Hilkiah found it. So naturally, I, I says, I got to check this guy, Hilkiah, out. What does his name come into numbers? Nothing but 1611. Wow. The 1611 found the 1611. The Urim found the Thummim. The priest found a book of the law of the Lord given by Moses. And Hilkiah answered and said to Shephan, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah delivered the book to Shephan. And Shephan carried the book to the king. This is 3416. Got to watch those 3416. 34 means foundation. 16 means holiness. He's bringing the holy book the masculine he Bible, he's bringing it to the king. That's where it's got to go because it's the king's book, bringing it to the king. He, he carried the book to the king and brought the king word back. See, God always is taking us back. We've got to go back. Remember, we talked about backward last week, I believe it was. He, he, he's bringing it back. The world is always trying to move forward. God is always trying to get us to go back to that first marriage that we had in the womb, that first beautiful setting that we had in the garden. That's why he tells us to repent and go back again, saying, all that was committed to thy servants, they do it. And they have gathered together the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have delivered it to the hand of the overseer and the hand of the working. So Shaphan the scribe told the king saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book and Shaphan read it before the king. Read is an interesting word. Remember in the New Testament, Jesus said, I am the bread. You drop the factotum, which is the first letter, and now you have read. I am the bread. He is reading this to the king. Came to pass when the king had heard the words of the law that he rent his clothes, tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah and Achiah and the son of Shaphan and Abdam and the son of Micah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asia, the servant, and the king saying, go inquire of the Lord for me. 
and for them that are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words, W-O-R-D-E-S, so the physical words of the book that is found for great wrath of the Lord is poured out upon us because of our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after that is written in the book. And Hilkiah and they that the king had appointed went to Huldah, the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Turkia, the son of Hezkariah, or however you pronounce his word, the keeper of the wardrobe. She now dwelt in Jerusalem in the college, and they spake to her to that effect. Notice Huldah is associated with the college, which is associated with knowledge, which is associated with wisdom. Notice they bring it to the king, to the masculine first, then they bring mm -hmm. it to the woman, always bringing them together. And notice he says, go and inquire of the Lord. He's telling them to go pray. Prayer is a very powerful thing. It's the urim that is coupled to the thumb or the book. They go hand in hand like a glove. Prayer will change and do something to you. I remember when I first came to seminary, Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. Some of you have heard of that. They, every 40, 50 years, a revival seems to break out at the college across the street. And I was there about 50 years ago when it broke out. It's quite a, an amazing thing to experience the outpouring of God where all the classes shut down and nothing happening but just prayer and praising and worshiping God week after week. It just kept going. It's just amazing. Well, I bumped into a fellow named Dwight. He was a same year classmate, we both come into seminary together, both excited to learn things about the Bible and the word and to go out and change the world. That's you know, all young seminaries come in with that desire. And some of them go away confused. After three years of seminary, you don't know what to believe sometimes. Uh, but anyway, Dwight and I became fast friends. And so God laid it on our hearts why don't we, at the end of every week, there's a little chapel next to the main chapel where the whole uh, student body would meet every day for chapel. But there was a little tiny chapel, a prayer chapel right next door. So Dwight and I decided, let's start praying. We'll meet on Friday night for the long weekend. The long week had finished and sometimes exhausting. So we decided we're going to have an all-night Friday night prayer meeting every week or every week that was possible for us to do that. So we started meeting. And that's kind of a dangerous thing to do because you, uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, God starts really speaking. I don't know why he loves that time, but he starts moving on your hearts. And the next thing you know, we had a burden for missions. And the next thing you know, we're planning to go to a foreign country over Christmas vacation. Instead of going home for Christmas vacation, we decided, let's go preaching in a foreign country. So we decided to go to Central America. That was close. And we got on TAC Airlines and got on a plane from New Orleans and flew down to Belize, which was then British Honduras. Today it's called Belize. We had a great time preaching. Prayer changes. It, it moves the whole direction of your life. So now we come back to seminary, and we're back to our Friday night prayer meetings. And now we're pumped up because that's my first real experience on a mission field. And I loved it. And Dwight loved it too. And to, to see people's lives changing. I remember I... We came to this one village, and it's proper in these small countries. 
is you don't just go in and start preaching. You go uh, find out who's the village chief. And uh, I found the village chief and talked to him and said, you know, let, let them know what we're doing there. And through it, my relationship with him, he got saved. And uh, and then it, it, it was later, uh, he wanted me to teach him about the Bible. So he wanted me to stay at his house and a very simple little house, kind of a grass hut and dirt floors. And uh, so I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. I said, where do you want me to sleep? He pulls a chair back by the kitchen table. You sleep under the table there on the dirt floor. So that was kind of an experience. See, I, I, I've learned in, in life's journey that a man with an argument is no match for a man with an experience. And that's why you want to get as many experiences with God as you can. When you get saved, that's a powerful experience. Many people remember the day. I can remember almost, I think it was the 15th of June, I got saved. I went forward at a crusade and got saved. And my life dramatically changed. And then uh, a year later at a Henry Unruh crusade, a small evangelist from Canada, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. That just catapulted me more. And so leading a village chief to Christ and seeing him grow and have an experience, it's absolutely amazing how, how it, it just changes people. Uh, we, uh, I think this was on, on the second time I was down in Belize there. Uh, we got to know the president of the country. Now, that, that, that's a uh, divine appointment when the, the president has you into his presence. And then they take pictures of you, and then they put you on the front page of the newspaper. I had, uh, well, I went back to Asbury, and uh, we started praying again, and God laid it on my heart. You need to go back to Belize. And you need to take a team of people. Well, by this time, I was, I had one year left of seminary. And I thought, man, I want to graduate from seminary. God said, take the year off. Turn three years into four. That'd be okay for you. So I took the year off, went across the United States recruiting people. And I got about 26 people, wonderful people that wanted to go to Belize and do missionary work. And so we brought them down there. And then that's when the president invited us all into his office there. And then they put us on the front page of the uh, Belize Times or whatever it was called. I still have the picture of the newspaper. And here's what God does. This is all a result of prayer. And I'm trying to tie this in prayer and the book. We told the president We'd love to go preaching in the islands around Belize. He said, I can help you. I'll give you my boat. He didn't give it to us, but I'll loan you. He, he had the, 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 main, the boat that was his private boat and his private boat driver. And they gave us all the Coke we could drink. I don't know it was good for us, but it was delicious. And he sent us out to preach the gospel. Here's the, and, and the wife, the vice president's wife came to me and said, uh, Howard, could you lead my husband to Christ? I mean, this is divine appointments that happened. Here's a nation, the, the president, the vice president. And then he gives us his boat and he said, go. So we go to this island. I don't know where we're going, but we'll get to this island. and Oh, let's hold a big revival here tonight. See, prayer does strange things to you. So where are we going to hold it? I'm looking around and the village, remember these are all grass huts, but there was one building, building in the center of the whole place was a uh, theater, big old theater. And that was a big deal to people there uh, 50 years ago. Who've seen a movie picture before? Come and sit down, 
coming from a grass hut and sit down and watch John Wayne or whatever movie they're showing. And uh, <clears throat> so I go to the theater owner. I find Chase him down. I said, listen, we would like to hold a, a meeting here, preach the gospel in your village here tonight. Would it be possible that we could use your theater? Because it's got seats. It's got everything that we need to hold a, hold a meeting. He thinks a little bit, you know, and I'm going to have to postpone my movie tonight. I said, well, we're glad to pay your rent or whatever you want. He said, I'll tell you what, if you pay the electric bill for the evening, you can have the theater for the whole basically day, uh, afternoon and evening. I said, we're on. How much is that going to be? I think it was $2.46, which would be like $10, $12 today. I said, hey, no problem here. We'll give you Give them a little more, whatever. So we're <clears throat> we're in there, and we announced that uh, you know we had a team of twenty six people going going around, telling everybody we're going to have a meeting tonight. And of course, that was really to the natives that that was a really a big deal. A bunch of Americans are going to be here tonight up in the theater. So the theater was packed. There wasn't. I don't think there was a seat left. And we have our time of prayer and then the girls sang and people gave testimonies. And then uh, there were three or four of us that preached the sermon. And I think I preached twice. The people wouldn't go home. Finally, I told Nicholas Creel, who was helped us in interpreting. He was the village chief that I'd led the night before to Christ. He spoke four languages, English, uh, Creole, uh, Spanish and one other language. And uh, I said, so he interpreted for us, such a nice fellow. You think that here we had the village chief as interpreter. And I said, Nicholas, we're all preached out. You got saved last night. Why don't you get up and tell your testimony? So he gets up and starts preaching. I mean, it was just amazing to see how God does things. All of this came out of praying every night on a Friday night, and God moved our heart. Well, when we get, we get back, and uh, the head missionary there said, uh, Howard, would you like an interesting experience? Well, I've always learned that a man with an argument is not, no competition to a man uh, he, he, with an experience. So I want to get as many experiences as I can. You can't talk me out of Jesus. You can't talk me out of prayer. You can't talk me because I, I've experienced that. When uh, 1021 of Exodus, God said, I'm going to send darkness so thick the people can feel it. When you get into the thick darkness of the 1611 Bible, you can feel the presence of God. It's unique. It's even different. Then the 1833, which is a wonderful book because it's a light to the Gentile that brings you to the 1611. So I, I like things you can experience and you can feel. So he said, would you like to preach in an unusual place? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'd like to preach any place there's someone willing to listen. He said, would you like to go and preach in the slaughterhouse? Now, I don't know if some of you may not know what a slaughterhouse is. That's uh, down there in Belize. It was in the seedy area of town. And it's uh, a building like a big garage without walls. It's stinky because there's blood everywhere. They, they butcher the cows there. They butcher the pigs there. Butcher different animals, goats and whatever else. And uh, then the meat goes to the local meat market and the grocery stores and the restaurants and whatever else. But he said, I, I got to warn you, this is a dangerous assignment because this is where the street gangs hang out. He said, it's usually so dangerous down there that the local police will not go down in that area of the slaughterhouse for fear of being killed. So it's dangerous. So I, I made the decision that 
Uh, we had 26 people, and I, I decided, I think the ladies, the young girls, uh, and we had a lot of beautiful young girls, uh, it might be too dangerous. I don't want anybody to get raped or hurt or knifed or that type of thing. So I made the decision that just three or four of us guys will go down. I picked the toughest guys. We, we, we'll go down and you be my bodyguards and we'll see what happens. So I get down there. Sure enough, there's a gang roving around there. I, I don't know, maybe 15 members or more in the gang. And uh, we come down at, what are you doing in our territory, basically? They, you, you can see what the wheels are going in their head. Why, what are you doing now? Well, we come to preach the gospel. Oh, well, you know, what's the gospel? Well, you, you just sit there and they had, uh, they did have a, a, a bar that went around the whole perimeter, pretty much, except on the ends where uh, it was like a flat two by six or something. So it made a nice seat. So they all sat up there doing there. And uh, uh, I was introduced and I'm from America and I, I'm here to share the gospel with you. So I, I get preaching. And I no more got into five minutes into my sermon. And this gang member steps up right in front of me, interrupts my sermon. And I didn't know if he was going to pull a knife out, pull a gun out, what, what's going to go here. Hey, he said, uh, is that a wedding ring? I said, yeah. He said, uh, would you give it to me? Give it to me. Well, he was more forceful than that. I was fearful. And I said, Lord, what do I do? That's for prayer. He said, give it to him. So I take my wedding ring off. I give it to him. I get a little bit further into the message, maybe five more minutes. Guy comes up and he said, uh, I like that watch. Haven't seen one like that. It was a simple watch, maybe a $20, $30 watch. Give it to me. I want it. Lord, what do I do? Give it to them. So I take off my watch. They're kind of slowly stripping me down. Five minutes more, a gang member comes up and, you have a wallet? Yeah. Give it to me. I'm taking your wallet. Okay. By now I'm trained. So I didn't want a knife in my back. I didn't know where this was going, if I was going to come out alive or not. So I gave him my wallet. At that time, I was thankful. You know, I'm glad I left my airline tickets and my passport back at the house. <laughs> at least I can get out of the country. I may not have a wallet. I may not have a wedding ring. I don't have a watch. And the last guy came and took my glasses. I don't know what he was going to want him to. I don't think they were his prescription, but he wanted them, so I gave them to him. So I go on and I finish the message. And after the message, people are milling around and uh, talking to each other. And I'm wondering, am I ever going to see my wedding ring? Am I ever going to see my watch and my glasses and my wallet? But I figured, well, Lord, you're going to take care of me. You've always taken care of me. So what difference does it make? Then all of a sudden, this one guy comes up to me, a gang leader. He said, here's your wedding ring back. Then came a guy, here's your watch back. Another guy, here's your glasses. Here's your wallet. So thank you. He said, you know what we're doing? We were testing you to see if you really believed what you were preaching. Wow. I said, well, how did I do? He said, you passed. He says, as a matter of fact, anytime you want to come down here and preach to the gangs, we'll make the gang sit there and if they get out of order trying to hurt you we'll beat them up we'll be your your guards your bodyguards so you never know what can happen in a situation god has a way of doing things preparing the way he fights the battle for us all we have to do is fight the battle of sin and iniquity within us that's all we got to do. And when we 
have the right book. You see, a lot of times when you go to a church, well, I could finish this here. Uh, uh, Second Chronicles 34, we know that he, uh, Josiah gave us the best, it says the, the best uh, Passover that was ever held. He kept the Passover. And he was the king and he made a covenant to walk after the Lord to keep his commandments, his testimonies. So this is, is, is really, really powerful. Now, I want to show you a seismic shift and then I'll come back to what I was going to say there. Isaiah 34, 16. Here we go. We're, we're, we're getting there. 34, 16. Notice what it says here. And uh, I don't know if you, uh, any of you have heard of the great vowel shift. The V and the U and the I. Uh, this is in the 17, 1800s. They shifted our whole language away from understanding real English. So you got to understand, you have to, uh, history is one of the most important lessons we can learn because history takes us backward. It's, it's a form of repentance, if you believe it. You, you, you start digging into the past. And uh, the past here, they always called it the book of the law. That's how it was known all through the scripture. When it was in the ark, the book of the law, when they uh, took us to Jeremiah 3.16. Oh, let me jump right there. I'm going to come back to 34. Jeremiah 3.16. It says, uh, we'll start in 14. Turn ye, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you. God is declaring his marriage. And I'll take of you one of a city, two of a family. I'll bring you to Zion. I will give you pastors, P-A-S-T-O-U-R-S, -S, according to my heart. Now, when it says many pastors have destroyed my vineyard, it spells it P-A-S-T-O-R-S. -S. Most pastors don't even know how to spell the word pastor. I didn't know this until I got into this here. According to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Notice the pastor is male, feeding you with the female. Get that relationship. Urm and thummim, urm and thummim. He's the urm feeding you the thummim. Okay. And I will give you pastors, according to my heart. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit Neither shall it be done anymore. They're doing away with the box because the people were worshiping the box instead of the contents, the book. And so God is replacing the box with the word, the book. They had replaced and, and thought the box was more important than the book. Now, the box had power in it. People died for looking into it. But it, because of the contents of the book. Today, people have replaced the book with the church. Many people don't even bring a Bible to church anymore because they're enamored with 
the church, the building, and the people, and missing the point of the book. Now, look, look at here. This is a seismic shift, just like the great vowel shift. God shifted here, and he's pulling out his biggest canon. His canon is the Word of God. It's even, the scriptures are even called a canon. If you study history, they call him a canon. This is his big, powerful canon. So he's renaming the canon. He once called it the book of the law. But that was so associated with the Old Testament and legalism that God says, you know, we need a, a new name. And so, and just like he says, every one of us is on a, on a little stone, he's going to write a new name that only he knows and you know in Revelation, going to give us a new name. So here he gives us a brand new name to the word of God. The only place he does it here in the whole Bible, it's laid out prophetically, is here in Isaiah 34, 16. Remember when we were talking about Josiah, when he brought the book to the king, it was 2 Chronicles 34, 16. Notice the pattern. 34 means a foundation. Do you notice in 1634, you built a whole book called 1611, measured 16 by 11, and basically weighed 16 pounds, 11 ounces, without the covers. One of the seven books. I call it one of the seven spirits of God, one of the seven eyes of God. He names the book after the foundation so we can understand that this book is our foundation. So what does he say here? Seek ye out the book of the Lord. See what he changed it? Instead of the book of the law, now he calls it the book of the Lord. Of the Lord comes out to 1611 in Numbers. Seek ye the book of the six, seek ye the 1611 and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her mate. Think about that. When you get the book of the Lord, you're getting a mate. You're getting wisdom. You're getting married because the Bible is nothing more than a marriage contract. You were married in the womb. It says your maker is your husband. Well, you were made in the womb. So obviously, if he's your husband, you were married in the womb. You came out of the womb, fell into sin, got married to Baal, got into adultery, you deserve to be put to death, spend eternity in hell. But God, Jesus went to the cross. God sent his son, Jesus, went to the cross to pay the penalty. I like my hat here. He, Jesus paid it all, that we might have life and have more money. See, all this is about turning us away from sin and turning us back to God and to fellowship with him, it, to our mate, the wife of our youth. Wow. Have you ever thought that the, the wife of your youth in Malachi may not be the girl you married when you were 20 years old, but it may be wisdom who you married at five or six years old, where it says, Solomon said, I chose wisdom as my wife. That's over in Wisdom 8, uh, uh, 2 or 3 in that first chapter, of, or in that chapter of Wisdom, in the Apocrypha. Seek ye out the book of the Lord. Totally changes the dynamics here. 
And the first instruction is to read. When you read, you're eating the word. You're reading it. And it, it begins to change you. And then you couple that with prayer. They would read the book a fourth part of the day. We had, hardly can have a service for an hour in a church today. They would read a fourth part of the day under Ezra and Nehemiah. And then they would begin to worship and pray. Wow. So seek ye out the book of the Lord and read, and no one of these shall fail. None of these scriptures will fail. This book is perfect. None shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded. God commanded. Remember, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4, 4, it's repeated in Luke 4.4, 4.4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, 4, there's 16. How many fingers, how many bones in your four fingers? 16. How many bones in your thumb? Three. How many in your wrist? Eight. Sixteen, eleven, your hands. Wow. And, and all that goes back to Deuteronomy 8, 3, says the same thing. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Wow. For my mouth it is commanded, and his spirit, that masculine spirit propels us. It has gathered them, scattering the church. And he has cast the lot for them, and his hand has divided it unto them by line. Remember what he said? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Here he's saying it again. He's divided this book into lines, and they shall possess it forever. Do you know that if you get a 1611 Bible and begin to understand what it is and, and, and get born again, you will possess this book forever from generation to generation. They shall dwell therein. This becomes your temple. This becomes your tabernacle. This becomes the head of the church. So you don't have to worry about what church to go to. People say, you, have you ever heard an evangelist? I've heard guys say, well, even Joel Aston says that He says, if you prayed that little prayer, we believe you got born again. And I think some people do. He says, now go find a good church. How does a newborn baby know what a good church is? How does he know what a Bible is? You see, what they should tell you, and everybody should tell you, this don't go find a good Bible because there are many books. There's about, some say as many as 400. I don't know if it's actually that many, but easily over 200 different English translations now and many in other languages. And many of them contradicting each other. No, you tell people, you go find the book of the Lord. God's book, the one that he finished, the one that he wrote. He wouldn't build a person in the womb and say, well, you know, uh, Jesus and the Holy Ghost are talking. I think we'll just leave his eyeballs out and let him finish it. That wouldn't be a finished baby. God would not start a project like the Bible and not finish it. He finished it under King James. That's a whole other story. But you can see the power of this book. It's going to be with you from generation to generation forever. So don't worry about what church. If you want to go to a Buddhist church, go to a Buddhist church. The key is for you is to have a 1611 Bible because it will turn you into an evangelist. And when you're in that Buddhist church, you'll say this like, I said to a Buddhist, I said, you know, why are you following Buddha? Buddha is dead. Buddha said, man enters into the water and causes no ripple. Jesus said, man enters into the water and causes a ripple that doesn't end. 
You see the power of this book. Wherever you are, if you're in the right book, because you're hooked up with the right Jesus and you're hooked up with him and the Holy Ghost. And as you meditate on this book and as you worship in this book and as you come to understand the spellings and the words, it, it totally transform you and it starts to change everybody you meet. That's the dynamics. You are an automatic evangelist. You are a preacher wherever you go. You are a prophet. You are whatever gift God wants to lay on you at the where the need is, he will lay a gift on you and will open the doors, just like when we were in that theater, we were on that island, we were in the presence of a king of a nation, and he comes so sympathetic to us. It, it wasn't us, it was God that put it in his heart to open his heart. I'll provide my boat to help you get there. We didn't know how we were gonna get there, but God did. God got us in his office just at a perfect timing and his heart and the boat was available. Everything was set up for us. Yes. The battle is the Lord's. Once we see that and all we've got to do is walk in holiness and righteousness and seek to know God and seek to do. And maybe we could close with this. We, we go to Galatians. I love this here. But if we be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. See, that's why he changed the name of his book. He changed it to you. We're under the Lord now. You see that? Seek ye out the book, not the book of the law. Seek ye out the book of the Lord. Yes, it contains the law, and the law is righteous and and all those things. But we are saved by grace, which is not of works, lest any man should boast. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. But if we be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, he's shown us what the flesh is like, are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Do you see any of those things in your life? You got to cut them out because you said, and then there's envying, there's murdering, murderers, or murderers, excuse me, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've told you in times past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. Eternity is too long to be wrong. We're either going to spend eternity in heaven or in hell. The Bible says, Jesus warned us, narrow is the way to heaven, and few there be that find it. That ought to scare every one of us. Many of you listening may not be right with Christ right now. He said, narrow is the way and few that be that find it. That means probably, he said, it's like a drop compared to a wave in the ocean that are going to make it into heaven. That means probably 99% of your neighbors and people in America are going to spend eternity in hell, which is a scary, scary thought and a horrible thing when you understand how Jesus said it's better to cut your hand off, cut your foot off, pluck your eye out than go to hell. This is serious business. This is more serious than any college education, than anything you can think of. You don't want to be caught in this trap. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he changes the subject here. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such thing there is no law. Don't you want to be in that category? Don't you want to have a house up in heaven that... You don't have to pay the electric bill, the heat bill, 
all your food will be served, apply, everything will be provided for you. Your body won't wear out. Everything is going to be beautiful. I'm hoping there's even street rides up there, but if there isn't, I believe Jesus is a street rider because Moses held up his rod. So he had to be a street rider and divided the Red Sea. Yeah. Wow. But if they're not, I'll take whatever God has. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. You've got to be crucified to get up there. If a man has a wife and the man dies, the wife is free to marry. You cannot be free to get remarried until there's a death. Jesus had to die and you had to die. There has to be a death. You have, your flesh has got to die if you want to get remarried and if you want to go to heaven. So this is, I know I'm laying a lot of things on you, but this is important stuff. I'll never forget it's at the University of Kentucky Medical Center. And it was the end of my shift. I was a chaplain there in a specialized program we had four professors and three students. That's a pretty good ratio. It was a pilot program. I don't know how I got in. I don't know how I get in half these things. Had to be a God thing to put me in there. And I'm just leaving. They even gave us our own special parking spot. That was kind of nice. I've, I've never had my own parking spot at a big hospital before. And they paid us wages. And we were students. It was a, it was a wonderful program. I'm just about to leave and over the PA system, chaplain needed such and such a room. I go down there. There's a man that had been in a coma for five, six months. I'm not exactly sure. Just came out of the coma. The first thing he asked for is the chaplain. And I'm the only one available. And I'm just a young kid in seminary, just about to graduate. And uh, so I go down there and I says, you know, introduce myself and can I help you? He said, would you read some scriptures to me? He know he'd just come out of a coma. And, and that's an amazing thing that he would know to call a chaplain. I think somebody somewhere was praying for that man power of prayer. He was an alcoholic. He was yellow, yellow jaundice. His liver had failed. He was clear that it was not long and he was going to go into eternity for all eternity. And once you're dead, there's no more time for choices and changing. So I start reading all the nice scriptures I can find. And he was hard of hearing, so I had to kind of yell him out so everybody in the area was hearing me. He said, Sonny, come here. I don't think you understand what you're doing here. I'm about to die, and I don't want to go to hell. Give it to me straight. Don't give me all these soft, nice scriptures. Give it to me straight. So I started yelling out every scripture I could find, of judgment and justice, heaven and hell, and all these scriptures. And after I'd kind of preached to him for 10, 10 minutes or whatever it was. He said, come here, let's pray. And the guy, we held hands and he prayed. Jesus came into his life and you could just see his whole countenance change, just total peace. He was a brand new person. And about a half an hour later, he slipped back into a coma and then later died. Wow. Now, God brought me there for that purpose. He that waters is nothing. He that plants is nothing. I'm nothing. It's God who gives the increase. It was God who arranged that whole meeting. I was ready to go home and have some hot dogs and whatever. And God, hey, no, no. I want you. I got another assignment for you. And we've got to be ready to be on assignment with God. That's the fun thing of working for God. Because we never know where he's going to place us, who he's going to place us in front, who he's going to 
be with. And this is what he says here. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desires of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. Put aside all that foolishness and, and just look at the fruits of the Spirit. And even if you don't feel like it sometimes, walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. They that walk in the Spirit are the children of God, and there's no condemnation. This is the, the best program. Uh, you know, I tell people that when they come to work for me sometimes, I say the pay is not good, but the retirement plan is out of this world. Uh, I work for, as a pastor, they promised me a salary, but they never had the money. I, I worked for about 17 years without a salary, raising six children. But God did it. But I know the retirement plan is out of this world. Just serve God. Amen. Thank you. I hope you, you enjoyed this uh, little session here. Do you have any questions, Joni? No, I am totally beyond the beyond. Um, this was so powerful to me. I have learned so much. Your testimonies, um, the working of prayer with the word, understanding. I mean, this is so groundbreaking and I mean, it's more than just groundbreaking. I hate those kind of common yeah. words. I mean, it's like you know, you come so far reading the word. You, you you just do, you know, and you do feel there's more. You don't know. You can't understand it. You just you keep going in this circle and you keep going, saying the word because that's all you got. Right. And no one is teaching this, Howard. No one. Like no one is teaching us any of this. And I just want you to know that I am. Uh, I know so many people would be agreeing with me right now. Like we are so grateful for everything God showed you. And um, I mean, I'm taking notes like crazy and um, it's life changing for me. Like it, it is absolutely life changing for me. It's like a door swung open and God said, come a little higher up. I'm going to show you something. You know, I think about, I mean, it's kind of, it's a negative way to say it, but like when Ezekiel in eight chapter eight of Ezekiel, when he said, son of, son of man, go to the temple and, you know, dig, you know, go and see these men and then now dig through the wall. And he says, uh, greater things will these will be shown to you. And, you know, even Jesus said to Nathaniel, he said, you believe because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. Greater things will you see than th than these, these things. And, and there, there's a, it's a vast supply but you know what I feel like that there's a timing involved with all of this because there is a lot of us that are like core bible studiers like we are students of the word I mean we are committed to the lord um, I don't want to say here I am mature I mean how do you gauge what mature is I know that we've been in it many I speak for so many listening that have been in it even longer than me that people that watch this there's people in their 70s there's people in their 80s that watch this and they are, I mean, and my, I mean, they're so way up the road, but this is something they have never heard before. And they're rejoicing in it. Like when you look at the comments, the things that people are saying, um, I stand with them where we are in awe, we're amazed. You know, I think of that scripture that says, they that sat in darkness saw a great light. Mm -hmm. You know, and Christ is that great light. We cannot receive any, if, if, it's like when you were talking about you and your friend who prayed every Friday, right? It was just once every Friday, but a door swung wide open. You, you didn't, you just prayed. You, you couldn't know, right. but God knew. And then you didn't know anything that kept happening. And then the watch and the ring and the glasses, and the wallet thing, you just kept saying, okay, Lord. And you just kept going along with them. And see, there's so much more like, especially when you're talking about the ark, you're like, it's a box. It just held in the most important things. The book of the law was put into a compartment on the side and it held the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod that budded in the jar of manna. And there's all this focus. And, you know, I've read that scripture forever, like in Jeremiah 316, but I never understood it the way you just taught that. 
I never understood it. I never saw it before. Like, wait a minute, everybody, like even the, remember uh, Eli, the priest, remember he fainted, oh, they, they captured the ark and he falls backwards and he breaks his neck and he dies. And then his daughter-in-law has a baby all of a sudden she's, you know, right. And Ichabod and, and so there's so much, you know, I mean, it answers everything you said answers personally to me. There's things that the Lord is speaking to my heart, like about things in prayer, but the things you were saying, I felt like Jesus was speaking to me. And I know that so many things that you said, I know Jesus is speaking through you to so many people. And uh, I can't wait to actually post this video because I want everybody to start I to start watching it. And I was thinking to myself when you were talking toward the end, and I said to him, Lord, what do I call this? What title do I give this? Because they're, they know you now and they're going to get used to you. But titles are everything because um, I'm not about clickbait. Clickbait is where you, it's like kind of like tabloid. I don't do the clickbait. I want people to hear what you're talking about, but everything you spoke about was so like, I felt like if, if I could see myself as one of those people during Jesus day on that Mount of Olives, just a regular, I'm a girl. I have some, you know, a couple sheep over here. I'm making some bread during the day and whatever I'm doing. And I'm hearing things like even the Athenians, right? They said, we have heard strange things today. We'll hear more of uh, this tomorrow. And so I was thinking even lately because of you know, just things you teach carry over for a long time with me. And I remember that when I first started talking to you, I said those words. I said, Lord, I've heard strange things today, but I want to hear more. And um, but this is his gift. Like you were talking about the potency of his word and uh, that it's him. He is the word and that the valuation of the language is not of what we're reading today. I mean, it's just, it's so blurry when you think of, when you have this light and then you see how the language changed and how we don't understand the he and the she. And, and I've always wondered about that. I'm like, why, like David, when he says he calls his soul a she, like, how would you answer that? Cause I know a lot of people have asked me and I've never really had the answer to that. Like why he would call it being a man why would he call his soul a she? Also calls it his darling. And uh, uh, Psalms 34 there calls his heart a she. He, he's kind of taking himself back because Adam was made and the she was inside of him. And, and the she is still inside of all of us. And of course, the woman also has talked about the hidden man of the heart. It, it, it uses these things so many ways. When I started understanding the he and she and that Genesis 127, it opens the door to everything. There, When you look today, almost every church in America is using a she Bible. The she was never designed to fight. We're losing some I've heard as many as 10,000 churches a year. I don't think it's full of that much. Three or 4,000 churches a year are now going out of business. The church is failing. Many of the big name ministers are failing and crashing because they've focused on them and their ministry and their box, their big fancy building, instead of the focus on the He Bible the man of war. Uh, look what the Apocrypha says. I've read this before, but it's a great verse. This is Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, scripture 15. Thine almighty word leapt down from heaven out of thy ro royal throne as a fierce man of war into the midst of a land of destruction. America today is the midst of a land of destruction. And what we need is that fierce man of war because it's God's book. It's his angel. The angel of God came down, which was really the 1611, and killed 185,000 enemies of God in one night. He can do that then. 
He can do that in America. But we have to put ourselves like Hezekiah in prayer. And we have to turn the fighting over to God. That's the key. We have to fight against sin and iniquity in our life. But then we have to turn, and the secret of this whole thing of having, I believe, a successful ministry that really changes the landscape. Most of these big ministries aren't changing. Any. America is getting worse and worse and worse it, it be, because we're trying to do it in our strength, and God won't accept that because he's a jealous guy. He says, that's my battle. You're trying to fight my war. Who are you to fight against Satan? You don't have the ability. I have the ability. Mm -hmm. But all I want you to do is turn me loose on them through mm -hmm. prayer and wow. worship. And that's the key. And I notice that in my own personal life. Uh, because the Bible, the eighth church in the book of Revelation are the overcomers. Everybody thinks there's seven churches, but he, but he ends every church with, he that overcometh, I'll grant this, I'll grant that, sit in my throne, so forth. It's the overcomers, the eighth church. They're the ones that are going to make it into heaven. There are many people sitting in church pews that will never make it into heaven. Jesus said, and you may be a virgin, but there are five foolish and five wise, but the five wise who had oil in their lamp, they had re read their book. And they knew the understanding of what God is doing. God's got plenty of people that love him, but he's got very few people that understand what he's doing because they haven't taken the time to read. You have to spend hours and hours and read. I, I, I've read the 1611 uh, series here at least 50 or 60 times, and I still don't know it. I'm, I'm barely getting into it. I, I, and every time I read it, did I, how could I miss that before? It just, you can't exhaust this Bible. You can't exhaust God. He is so amazing. He's so far above us. And all he wants to do is love us. He sent us his love letter. And all he wants us to do is read it. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. He tells us to read far more than even study. No, he wants us to study it. But he wants us to read. And then he reveals when we read and pray. Two things, read and pray. Irm and thumb. I better be quiet. Now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this this is so good. And of course, you know, you'll be back on next week. And I know you have so much more for us. I mean, I may even have to ask you to come on a Sunday or every now and then. I mean, just because there's so many people that don't are in a box. They're not in the box. <laughs> there's so many there people that watch yeah. this. Yeah, we, we could do a Sunday maybe. Well, I have Sunday at church Sunday morning. But then we'll have to uh, Sunday afternoon. And usually I'm feeling pretty good on Sundays because I have two days off of dialysis. And it usually takes me a day to get back to normal. And then I got to go back. And uh, I told them yesterday I'm here for the vampires. <laughs> but they're so kind. And, and I appreciate uh, the dialysis centers, all the ones I've been to because they're keeping me alive. Amen. Amen to that. Well, we'll have to get going now and uh, stay on. I'm going to stop the recording now. And so um, I'm going to put your information on how to contact you if somebody wants to call you. Okay. Uh, maybe they might want to buy a 1611 Bible or an 1833. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have some questions for you. So I will include your phone number. I, I don't sell them. I give them by donation. because Yes. To, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right donation I'm not in thank you business. for saying that because we want everybody to know that because sure. that's the truth all right well uh until next time next week we'll see you and uh, i think probably tuesdays work pretty good who yeah. knows unless something changes and god says thursday i don't know but we'll see you next week for sure god bless you and give my best to barbara thank you god bless bye